In this video, sponsored by the new Solo and Co-op expansion for Rain and Hell, the Oculus Spear, okay, uh, we're going to talk about some new thematic movements within miniatures. So as any kind of, um, let's say, art form starts to move along, starts to pick up steam over time, there will be different uh, kind of stylistic movements that will happen within the overall kind of structure of the idea behind the art, okay? Like think about how there used to be painting, there was the Impressionist movement and it had a definite look and feel and an idea behind it and there was the Cubist movement and there's been postmodern this and whatnot and all that kind of stuff. And that's stuff that fancy schmancy folks who paint on canvases and, 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 and think big thoughts like to do. It's a thing that happens, it's happening in pretty much all different forms of art and to some degree, it even happens in the type of stuff that we do, which some people don't really think of as art, but I like to think of it as art. So here's some art movements within uh, tabletop miniatures wargaming painting that you may not have heard of. If you've ever played a little game called Warhammer 40,000, you may have heard of the term grimdark. It is a term that gets thrown around a lot, and it has to pertain to the theme of the overall uh, the, everything, frankly, within the story, the artwork, uh, even in, within the game, as far as like the way that um, most models die in one hit kind of sort of situation. That's kind of a grimdark sort of a thing. The actual definition for grimdark, uh, it's a subgenre of speculative fiction with a tone, style, and setting that is particularly dystopian, amoral, or violent. So that's how it gets thrown around in regular literature, that kind of stuff. But within gaming, it also really covers a lot of what's going on, again, predominantly within the world of Warhammer 40,000. But there are other games that are also kind of grimdark or grimdark in slightly different ways. But if you're going to take the story out of it, if you're going to take the, the gameplay out of it and, and that kind of stuff, what does grimdark mean in the actual visuals? What does it mean when we're talking about the models? Um, grimdark is a term that gets thrown around also very frequently with something that's sometimes known as Blanchitsu. Now, Blanchitsu is named after a guy named John Blanche, who is an artist who has worked for Games Workshop for a number of years. I'm not sure if he still works with them or not, but he did a lot of stuff earlier on in... Um, you know, uh, Warhammer and uh, I think even Warhammer Fantasy and all that kind of different stuff. And he's got a very, very specific art style. And people started to try to sculpt or paint or sculpt and paint models, uh, kit bashing and things like that to make the stuff that was coming out of the company of Games Workshop start to actually look that was coming out of the artwork of John Blanche. And so Blanchitsu uh, was born, um, I think, I don't know if it's a term he came up with or not. I know there was an article, a column that used to be in White Dwarf called, um, I think it was called The Art of Blanchitsu or something like that. And that's where I first heard the term initially, but it may have come from someplace else. But it's very um, grimy, uh, a lot of warm, dark colors, a lot of uh, nothing bright, very little shiny metal either. Everything's kind of corroded and grungy and stuff like that. Now, frankly, I kind of stumbled into Grimdark slash uh, Blanchitsu myself just because um, that's kind of the way I like to paint. I just like it. It's not only is, does it give a visual that I really dig, but it also, um, I just like the process. I like I don't like painting things clean because when you goof it up, you have to go back and start over again or you have to try to figure out some sort of way to fix it. But if you kind of goof up a little bit when uh, you're trying to do something that's real grim dark, something blanchet suit, you just put more layers on top of it and no one will notice. It's, it's, it's all about the grunge, which is a big, again, and I've got lots of videos here on the channel about how to kind of do that kind of stuff. And so, well, here's a playlist actually. Pachow. Um, so definitely, you know, it's something that I really enjoy and you can, you can find out, you know, more about just kind of looking online, just type in hashtag grimdark or hashtag Blanchitsu and to say like, I don't know, how about Instagram? And you'll find a lot, especially if you type in the Blanchitsu one, you'll find a lot of things and you can just start to get ideas behind how to do it just by looking at it. But there's also plenty, plenty of YouTube videos about there, how to do the same thing closely related to the whole kind of grim, dark Blanchitsu sort of thing is uh, Ink 28 or Inquisition 28. You see the ink, I-N-Q, you see that a lot out there on the internet. Again, it, 
uh, Twitter, uh, you know, Instagram, wherever you want to look. So what Inquisition 28 is, is um, it relates to a game that Games Workshop actually put out back in the early 2000s just called Inquisition. And it was a skirmish game that was about uh, Inquisitors and their kind of war bands, their retinues and whatnot. And it was a fighting game, you know, like a, a small skirmish style game. The thing that was weird about it, well, there was a couple things that were weird about it. Number one, the miniatures were 54 millimeters high. So instead of being your normal 28 millimeter dudes, they were twice as high, which is weird. I mean, it's cool. You get to do a little bit more interesting things maybe with the paint, but then your terrain needs to be twice as big and everything else. And, and so it's, it's very easy to say to somebody, hey, I've got this new game and it's the same scale as all the other games that you play. It, it makes sense. People dig that kind of stuff. But when you go, hey, I made this new game, but it is twice as big as everything that you like to play, then all of a sudden um, people are going, well, yeah, especially when you have to, again, you have to then get bigger terrain. And that's kind of a problem for folks. But that was not the only problem with uh, Inquisition. Uh, it also, it kind of required a game master because it was really straddling the sort of line between 28 millimeter kind of war game. Well, actually it was straddling the line between fit now 54 millimeter uh, and then also RPG. It had a lot of, you know, war gaming, but also RPG elements in it. And so because of that, it sort of actually required um, some sort of game master. And uh, turns out that didn't work out so hot. Um, but it was a very interesting book. I've got a copy of it somewhere. I know I do. I didn't actually, I actually bought it only just a few years ago. It had been on the shelf at this local store since the early 2000s. And then I finally came along and plucked it up at retail price. But the, the thing that's interesting, in my opinion, is about it is that it has spawned a bunch of people who were like, I love where you were going with this, but... And I think that that's one of the great things about tabletop wargaming is that you can be, you can look at a product and go, hey, this is great except that we're going to fix it because it's not as great as it's like you're going in the right direction but we're going to fix things and that's what's great it's hard to do that frankly with video games um you can do it with a lot of different types of pr pretty much any kind of tabletop game but it, it, it's it's a little bit harder to do when then you have to get into the code so what people have done with ink 28 is tried to figure out ways to make that game that they can play at normal 28 millimeter size but also kind of get rid of a lot of the RPG elements of it. And there are people who are playing uh, a bunch of different versions that are Inquisimunda, which is basically kind of blending the Inquisitor aesthetic and all that kind of stuff into the Necromunda rule set, um, whether it's the new Necromunda, what they refer to as Necromunda 18, meaning it came out in 2018, or, or is it Necromunda 17? I think it's 17, actually. 18 was Kill Team. Because there's also um, Inc. 28 Kill Team kind of rules that people are putting out there. I've talked in the past about a game called Planet 28, which I enjoy quite a bit. Um, and that game is designed basically to be a very simple rule set for people who are really a lot of interested in the modeling and the painting and the doing all the weird kind of kit bashing that you see in the very interesting Inquisimunda stuff, um, but don't want to necessarily have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to figuring out a rule set. So boom, you know, you pick up Planet 28 and you got something to play with. Um, a really good example of the whole kind of Inquisimunda thing, which also gets into the Grim Dark and the Blanchitsu stuff, uh, definitely take a look at 28 Magazine. Um, and I've talked about 28 Magazine in the past here on the channel. I think it was in the TMX, or sorry, the, t the Tabletop Minions Awards, maybe 2018 or 2019. I don't exactly remember when. But um, yeah, it definitely check out Planet 28 to see all the amazing, weird looking stuff. If you want to see new types of um, ideas within tabletop gaming, stuff that doesn't look like the front of the box, then yeah, definitely check that out. Last thing I'm going to talk about is something that's called Turnip 28. Now, Turnip 28 is an interesting thing. I had just heard about it within the last year or so, and uh, I was very confused about it until I kind of did a bit of research. So Turnip 28 is kind of started by a guy named Max Fitzgerald. And the concept behind Turnip 28, and it started out as he's like, I'm making a game. And the game is in progress and it's been going for quite some time. I don't know that it's necessarily ready to go yet, but people are working on models for Turnip 28. Again, the, 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 the movement, if you will, the, the style, the thematic, uh, you know, just kind of exploration of the medium. And the idea basically is that it's post-apocalyptic though we don't know exactly when the apocalypse happened, but it was sometime after, at the very least, let's say the 
kind of like Napoleonic era. So it's post-apocalyptic Napoleonic, but the apocalypse came not by nukes or an asteroid, but by some sort of crazy freak out of all the plants and roots and stuff like that. So um, if you look about it, if you look it up on his Patreon, it'll just say that it's, and, and it's about turnips. Like that's literally kind of the explanation. But what this means is kind of Napoleonic his, historic miniatures that you can then take and tweak. You're kind of making them grimdark also, but you're also very frequently having plant matter sort of kind of growing out of them and looking weird. So they've got frequently uh, muskets maybe with bayonets. There's a lot of pointy beaky helmets with also pointy beaky uh, heads and stuff like that. And then again, not a lot of bright colors, not a lot of like shiny metal. We're talking again about a lot of kind of grunge. And it's very interesting to see. Now, um, uh, uh, Sean Sutter, who made uh, Relic Blade, has also produced a rule set called Sludge, which is designed to be played with Turnip 28 type miniatures. These games that are kind of dropped into these different sort of miniature movements, Planet 28, Sludge, you know, all that kind of stuff, these are really interesting in that they're giving, in my opinion, to some degree, specifically with Planet 28, it really gives me an excuse to work in that kind of medium. It gives me, like, I could just make a bunch of really cool models, and there's nothing wrong with that, but when I can make a bunch of really cool models in a really interesting style and kind of stretch my overall, like, this is how I like to do things, but then also go, well, I'm doing it for a game, though. I'm going to actually play with these. I'm not just doing them just to look at them. I'm actually, it, it gives me, specifically at least, another kind of motivation and makes me more interested in not just doing this for display or for funsies, but actually to get onto the tabletop. So this is just a small selection of some of the different kind of weird, almost kind of indie DIY type movements in the art of, um, you know, making ter uh, terrain, making miniatures, um, people making artwork that's about the miniatures, all kinds of stuff, people making games about the artwork, about the it, it's. It, there's a lot to it, and this is just, like I said, eh, depending on how you count Grimdark and Blanchitsu, it's like three or four of them, right? So um, if there's a, uh, a miniature kind of movement out there, an art movement within miniatures that's maybe actually turning into a game, maybe turning into something else that I didn't talk about, put it down in the comments below, because A, I'd like to learn more about it, and very frequently uh, the people who um, read the comments also want to learn things as well. So. I think it's fun. If you're interested in any one of these, just do a bunch of research. It's not real hard. Just go into Google. Just start typing in keywords, and you'll find really interesting stuff. Go on to Instagram, like I said. Go on to Twitter. Do keyword searches. You will find really interesting-looking stuff that will hopefully kind of maybe reinvigorate you into your painting and get you to start kit bashing and using weird colors and weird stuff and, uh, and, and doing something fun with it. You folks asked for it, and now it's here, the Oculus Spear, the solo and co-op expansion for Rain and Hell, the game that Vince Ventrell and I uh, produced back in uh, the end of May. And uh, this expansion is about 28 pages, it's PDF only, and it's pay what you want. So you can get it, uh, go to rainandhellgame.com to check it out. And uh, it's a, it basically it gives you six scenarios, but they are designed to be played in series. It's not just a roll of d6 and play whichever, you play the first one first, and then you get through that, and then you go to the second one, third, etc. And it tells a story that may change the face of hell. And it's something you can play solo. You can just basically build yourself a very simple 100 point uh, cabal, like you would for a normal like campaign style thing in the regular game and then take that as you traverse through these six different scenarios if you can because they're not easy um and then hopefully you'll um, come out the other end with um something new and something different that may change the way that hell uh it goes forward in the future so if you if you're interested if you haven't you know pulled the trigger on uh rain and hell yet because you're like well i've been really looking for something i can play by myself or i don't have anyone to play with now, you can get yourself Rain of Hell, you can also get yourself the expansion, the Oculus Spear, and um, it will give you the ability to play solo or co-op with a friend, and you two, both of you can go through this uh, six-part kind of story of scenarios, and um, I hope that you uh, get to, um, you know, Rain in Hell.